Hello and welcome to Over It. I'm one of your co-hosts, Kristan Kershaw, and beside me, next to me, above me, depending on the view that you're on, <laughs> on the video, <laughs> and if you come to the video, is... Suzanne Drum Kohlberg, <laughs> I've introduced myself, I don't know whether you're going to say it or not. Or... Yeah, I know. That awkward We're still song. finding our feet, I love this. <laughs> Natural flow, it's called. So <laughs> today we're going to be doing a podcast that we we likened it to East meets West and it's going to interweave a little bit of my history of how I came to do what I do, but also give us the chance for dialogue with you, Suze, on your experience and also for whoever's listening, we want you to consider where you're at with maybe a different view on your own personal situation and how that you maybe resonate with you. So just to give a bit of context, and I'm not going to give you my whole life story here. Sorry if you came for that, you know. Put the popcorn away, people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't have time for that right now. I can get totally into a story. Um, I came to the, so at the moment I help people understand what minerals do in their body. That's part of my, my role in my own consulting work, one-to-one -one with people, they get testing done. We look at what the minerals are, but a big part of what we do is also look at their stress pattern and other aspects to how they live, how they exist, how much their body is in fight or flight mode. And the other side of that is I teach people, practitioners, how to understand, how to work with it and do what I do, basically. But I haven't always been that way. Like my formal training in university was as an animal ecologist and an animal biologist. You couldn't get too much further from talking to people about stress and what that does to the minerals in their body than that. Um, so I was hardcore science. I was all about, you know, the numbers, the calculations the I mean the thing is that I always had part of me which really resonated with nature and nature doesn't take stock of the numbers and it doesn't do the counting of of stats of an area or anything like that nature just is and animals have a natural intuition that they follow they don't have someone to tell them what to eat when to eat all that sort of stuff they they're a lot more well, provided the humans don't get in the way nature is going to just exist right and I always really loved the ecology side of my studies more so I actually went and did another year of study as honours which we talked about in previously yes <laughs> um and I I guess I really resonated with that there can be a micro ecology sort of system in a little tiny area or a bigger area or in our bodies or whatever like I always was fascinated by these tiny little microsystems all the way through to massive world ecology type stuff. So that never left me. But in the meantime, I've ended up working in private industry and in engineering and as a technical writer, running my own business in a craft industry. And then finally, <laughs> sounds very finite, doesn't it? Um, I ended up <laughs> I ended up with uh, my youngest daughter being really unwell as a baby. And I, my twins' delivery had been uh, not what I planned. They were six weeks early and a caesarean was somewhat forced on me, which I later found out, well, I knew that likely they would encourage it with twins, but it didn't go as I wanted. I healed fine and everything else. But there was a lot of disconnect from having them arrive the way that they did. So I put a lot into learning and researching about when I finally did get pregnant again when my husband and I recovered from having twins and went, maybe we could go again, maybe. Um, and I'd actually had a really traumatic experience the year before I was pregnant with her with an ectopic pregnancy. I didn't think that I was ever going to fall pregnant again uh, because of that and the medical uh, errors, significant errors that led to me uh, being put into emergency surgery and losing a tube and significant internal bleeding and all sorts of stuff the year before. I didn't know if I'd fall pregnant again. So first of all, she's a little miracle baby that she even came to exist because they said that, oh, well, you know, basically you might need an IVF. And I'm like, well, I'm not, not going there. So clearly one ovary and fallopian tube did the job that they needed to do. And um, a year or so later I was pregnant again. 
beautiful pregnancy, natural delivery, told the obstetrician to stay out of the way and that I'd push the baby out by myself, which I, I did. By this stage, I had midwives by my side and I understood a bit more about my body. Again, you can go and do all the physiology you want, but until you start to, I looked inwards and started to realize that I actually knew what to do a lot more than I trusted myself with the twins. I didn't trust that my body could do what it needed to do. And I trusted the practitioners, doctors, whatever around me, which is fine. They ended up okay. There was um, some extended medical stays and stuff, but they were fine. And they're fine now as teenagers, you know, all these years later, they're good. But when it came to her arrival, I put all of this in, had an amazing delivery, out of hospital within six hours, came via the kids' school and had um, the little one in a capsule, held her behind a cover, like walked into one of the twins' um, school rooms and had the baby in a carrier but had my hand down low. And the teachers are like, and there were a couple of parent helpers who knew me, they're like, aren't you having a baby? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it was a very, this is the best story ever. <laughs> it was a very different way to announce the arrival of a baby because she was very, very, very fresh. And But it, that meant that her siblings got to see her very soon and all that. And then I could go home and be in bed and left alone in a quiet home. And I had, you know, midwives came to care for me, all that sort of stuff. So I had this amazing experience until she was three weeks old and I got mastitis and everything went downhill from there. And what I didn't realize is she was having feeding issues that we thought tongue tie revision at four days old resolved and it didn't um, or not fully. And so that all spiraled and so much I've learned since then. And that's not what today's session is about, but I trusted myself for that first, the delivery and the initial and even questioning the midwives going I think she's got reflux right from day two I said she's refluxing I'm like I've had twin babies before with reflux I know what silent reflux the gulping the oh, whatever yes and we had that the like, second time and not the first so I knew nothing and that took six months before it was addressed but yes so I, can I just jump in there I'm really yeah. curious because you, you're saying like you trusted yourself with the delivery you trusted yourself here what changed I I don't know. I think because I worked on the breastfeeding so much and then she was still, she gained weight to begin with really well and all the rest of it. And what I later worked out is because she still had tongue tie and probably lip tie and other restrictions going on, she couldn't latch properly. So she wasn't, to begin with, there was hormonal like flow of breast milk and I'd fed twins so my body knew what to do. But once that kind of reduced and the latch wasn't transferring milk, the demand was, well, you don't need as much, so I didn't make as much, which then yes. she started to not gain weight as much. Then I got mastitis because she wasn't transferring the milk well. And then we got antibiotics, which unfortunately was the spiral that, or the, the straw that really landed on the camel's back and flew down. <laughs> um, it was yeah, hard work. So then the antibiotics, as many people will know, can mess with gut health and all the rest, of, or, you know, gut function. But I think we were already on that slippery slope. Like it really did just finish off the job. And so then she was an average size baby, you know, all the things. And then suddenly was going towards 10th percentile weight wise. And I'm like, well, what mm. do I do? And she was screaming and projectile vomiting like we'd never had with the twins she could get milk a meter and a half away from her. And I'm like, for a little tiny baby, how the heck can you get so much liquid so far away from your body? And so I, I think I didn't trust that I knew what to do. I didn't know what to do. And I was so tired by this stage, the kind of newborn side of things and the mastitis really hit me hard. I did as many natural things as I knew how to at that point, because I was really keen on, I'm like I didn't use antibiotics through my whole anything. And now... <laughs> I'm sure I doubted myself at that point and felt really down on myself that I'd gotten so far and that I still needed it. Now, full caveat here, sometimes antibiotics are needed and you've got to do what you've got to do. Like I'm not going to be the one to say, don't go and get medical because that's not the case. If I literally did what was needed up to that point and then got to a point where I couldn't do any more, I'm pretty sure I had retained products like placenta stuff going on. There was a lot of complex stuff kind of floating around still, in the periphery and adjusting to having three kids, not two and all, all the things. So 
then started the going to see people to get help. And by the time she was three months old, we were we got a diagnosis from a random pediatrician who I ended up with. And my my older kids saw one pediatrician in our old city a lot because of their ongoing health stuff. But by the time we'd gotten to here, when they were five, you didn't need as much of that mm. kind of thing. So I hadn't gotten a pediatrician. Uh, we were just seeing the GP if we needed to type thing. So we happened that the pediatrician we got referred to was a guy that wasn't normally there or had was fairly new there and ended up not being there all that long. But it was one of these moments which I soon realised was the universe was being very kind if you follow God or whatever the thing is, right? Some The spirits were looking at me at that point to get a guy who sat and listened to all of my history of the three kids, not just her. And he went, you know, I think she's got a thing called eosinophilic esophagitis. And I'm like, well, what? <laughs> yeah, I'm like with my questions for him on it and I'm like can you write that down please my tired brain couldn't cope I'm like okay eosinophils that's familiar that's sort of some sort of cell and itis and you know some sort of inflammation anyway it's an allergic reaction in the throat to something that's been consumed it's not normal that they pick it up in babies but and he goes oh yeah by the way I think your son's got it too and I'm like okay and Later on, I went and looked at case studies of older kids and my son absolutely had so many of the characteristics of he would chew steaks and he would chipmunk because he didn't want to swallow it and he would use water to wash things down. And there were so many things which were flagging that he actually had some sort of inflammation going on. So all of a sudden you get this diagnosis and it's, again, someone else is telling you how, how to fix your child, how to whatever, I didn't trust myself that I knew what to do. I'd already started when she was two weeks old, uh, two to three, went off gluten, went off dairy. A friend had said that had made a big difference and that did help us. But it turned out, long story short, we ended up on an elimination diet with about 15 foods. And for a time, there was only three foods that I would, would eat because that seemed to have the best of what I could do until I spoke with a dietitian and stuff. There was sweet potato, chicken and rice. And that was all I was eating for a time for every meal. Mm. every single meal of the day and that was less stressful than eating more and having this chucky screamy can't sleep at night baby who was obviously not well um but I I begged my GP for reflux medication because that's all I knew from the twins but he was actually really resistant he's like oh I don't know and I was like pushing so I see the difference now in what I've learned because she was just inflamed from other things and from the mineral imbalance that she had inherited from where I was at at the time when I fell pregnant with her and grew her and all the things. But I couldn't trust myself. I still, for whatever reason, I don't know why that was, lots of social conditioning. So, again, probably a good time to say all of us have got some sort of conditioning from our parents, from our childhood, from our life experiences that we have that helps us to form our opinion of the world and how we we think and breathe, and most of us have been conditioned that someone other than us knows better than us about ourselves. Oh, Whether yes. That's... And this is a lesson I continue to relearn over and over. I had an experience of it just recently with my own coach. I was like, you can do that? Because, you know, and all we tend to see things very binary, like this, yeah. all this. Yep. And, yeah, so I love this. It's and that's been part of a huge part of my journey is finding that balancing point between my analytical brain going, but I need to understand how this is working and why this isn't working and da da da. Anyway, on her six month birthday, we went to a gastroenterologist who specialized in kids with this condition. And keeping in mind that this is a really reactive baby, and he never denied that. He never, thankfully, because he would have had a roast roaring response from me. But mama clearly, bear's coming yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, clearly you recognize that there was something not right in the situation and he asked me what I was feeding her and I'm like she was six months old that day as it just so happened and you're like breast milk um, <laughs> well she's grabbed chicken off my plate that went really badly she's grabbed sweet potato off my plate that also went really badly and then rice and she's fine on the rice so I guess you could say she's eating rice and he's like oh well, she doesn't have eosinophilic esophagitis, but you need to feed that child more food. And then when she's gagging, come back to me and I can help. At you feed- six months? Six months old. So most people only start introducing it around that age. So anywho. 
And what I've since learned is the allergy kids are actually better off if they're doing okay on milk, which she was by this stage. Um, while I think my supply wasn't as um, prolific as it was with the twins, um, she just made up for it by feeding all day. And she was fine. Me, <laughs> maybe a bit over felt out and all the rest of it at different times, but she was growing. She was a lightweight though, compared to the the big kids, the older kids had been huge they're, and they still are as teenagers. Like I'm five, nine and they're, I look up to them. They're six foot ish. It fascinates so, me the differences in children who, you know, from the same family with the same, you know, um, like I have my children, Xanthi was always above the 97th percentile and I was yep. always having discussions about, you know, potential childhood obesity. It's a whole story for another day, given my own background, that fear, I had a lot of fear, but Casimir, yep. you know, same parents, same genetics, fed the same thing, 10th percentile, always, you know, they were always trying to fatten him up and it was just like, how, like, anyway. <laughs> Fascinates me. Yeah, the uh, my elder daughter was well above the 97th percentile always from a once they got past the six week early thing probably by the time they were six months old they were big for age like whatever their six month old age not their premature age adjusted and all that sort of stuff they were large babies for that age let alone being six weeks early so mm. I suddenly had this full term five days beyond full term baby and it was messing with my head anyway as soon as he said that, and then, oh, the, the gastroenterolo- gastroenterologist passed me a tin of formula and said, you're not going to be able to feed that baby, so you should probably just put her on the formula before she gets to sort of eight months old because then she won't take it after that. And I'm like, but she, what if she reacts to that? Oh, well, basically, and the chances were she was so reactive. There were so many kids by this stage I'd been talking to a lot of other parents and that sort of thing. There was a high chance that she could react to that formula. So I'm like, but the breastfeeding's working. And anyway, the immediate thought was game on, buddy. <laughs> you can't breastfeed that baby. Okay. So I let her wean and she happened to be four years old, more than four years old when she weaned. And that was always my intent that she would choose the right time. And as it was, members of the extended family said something to her and I think that actually caused her to wean but I mean she was over four she was fine but when we had big reactions to accidental exposures to foods and all sorts of stuff we later found out that she was likely celiac as well so accidental exposures even her touching play-doh I have suspicions was enough to ramp up her immune system at different points and have significant mm. reactions if I ate one teaspoon of the wrong food that could be three weeks worth of reactions for her. So this was not just a, a little crying baby or a slightly refluxy thing. It was a big stress on everyone. Anyway, she would breastfeed through that, but she would refuse all other food. So if I had have had her on a formula, which she may or may not have done well on, like the outcomes completely change in that time. It just meant that we had something to fall back on. But that was the first time when I started to go, I think I know best here. I still had moments well and truly after that, but it started to plant the seed. And not long after that, um, we got her allergy tested. So they did the skin pricks. And at eight months old, it's pretty stressful putting your child through that, I have to say, to do mm. the different pricks for the main things. But it meant I felt more reassured that if she accidentally picked up crumbs of something that had dairy in it or gluten, she wasn't going to suddenly go into full-blown anaphylaxis because she'd gone floppy after I ate strawberries and that was she'd projectile vomited and then gone floppy-ish and very sedate. Uh, we suspect a thing called f pies, which if any of the listeners have experienced that, it's a scary thing. And it's very poorly known by many, many doctors out there. Food-induced in, intercolitis um, something syndrome. It's, oh, no, maybe that's all of it. But it's basically a massive food reaction but not anaphylactic levels and they can often go blue and floppy and be non-responsive and she wasn't that extreme but I you can understand why I would be on edge as to anything going near her mouth or my mouth by accident how stressful that was so all of a sudden I'm controlling everything I'm eating everything she's touching like it was always high stress everything I but- can feel my heart rate rising and my chest constricting and my shoulders like <gasps> just hearing this like it's fascinating how a stress response could be activated by someone else's I just wanted to jump in with that yeah yeah and you know it's 
even to think of it now, and this is nine years ago now, more than she's soon to turn 10. And soon, right around that time, I think even between the two, maybe, I happened to go to a different pharmacist to get her reflux medication. And the guy goes, what are you doing for magnesium intake for her? And I'm like, and he said, well, the reflux medication she's on, she's on an adult dose. She was eight kilograms at that point. She was a featherweight in the scheme of babies of that age, but she ate kilos and was on an adult dose of reflux, like proton pump inhibiting hardcore reflux medication. And one of the side effects of that, which is known by all, should be known by all physicians, should I say, clearly is not, or they, they don't see it as necessary to make sure that people know, it actively pumps magnesium out of the body as a part of how it works. So you actually need to make sure that you're getting enough magnesium in your diet if you're on these medications. And they don't... This fascinates me. Sorry to interrupt, but given how many pregnant women suffer with reflux that they get treated even for the thing, the duration of the pregnancy... And then what is that passing on to the baby? Because yeah, the only time, thankfully touch wood and hopefully ever I was, I've ever suffered from reflux is both times I was pregnant. Yeah. And the irony that I've later worked out, read papers, talked to people and my own experience, which comes very soon is magnesium deficiency leads to changes in the digestive tract, which makes you more likely to reflux. So if you get enough magnesium in the body, you're much less likely to reflux. Mm. Pregnant women bit different because you can have upward pressure on the stomach and it changes physiology from a you know physical pressing things up but at the same time if they have enough magnesium and potassium then the little valve that's at the top of the stomach actually can work properly and should stop that but in babies that have reflux it, the valve is not working and that's at least a contributing factor if not a very very big factor of why it doesn't work and why they get the reflux and why you can hear the gulping and that sort of thing because it should all by all rights and theories that little sphincter should stop the the food from going up into the throat and hear the gulping or the burning and when they sometimes it doesn't even get higher up and you'll hear a baby kind of half hiccup and and then ah and that's they're refluxing lower down and it's causing them understandable pain but magnesium on me so after that i um took that on board and okay went and researched found the magnesium advocacy group on facebook and went, oh my goodness, and found resources all to do with it. Magnesium deficiency is a huge part of so many illnesses. And suddenly I there was a grid thing that I looked at uh, as far as conditions and different stages of um, sickness. And between either myself personally or my immediate family, we probably ticked off 80%, if not more, of those conditions. And there might have been 50 or 60 things there. And I've just gone, That's and we're amazing. a fairly healthy family in the scheme of things like collectively there's some sickness in the older generation but generally we're pretty typical Australians at that point anyway whereas I think there could be one or two things on that entire list that I would say that is in any of my immediate family now I just want to jump in there briefly and just show providence of like somebody's offhand comment in in any and I'd encourage your listeners where in your life has someone's offhand comment started a trajectory like this like the pharmacist just saying oh what are you doing about magnesium or something and you're like what and I can think you know things in my life where someone has just said something just offhand that has literally for you for you particularly literally changed the trajectory of you and your family and your daughter's life and now even your career so yeah yeah exactly and what I came to realize during this whole experience is there were a whole lot of those that kept happening. So happening to get that pediatrician who didn't just shuffle me out the door, even though it got a diagnosis that in the end, I, I'm pretty confident that she would have, if we had have gone and got a camera put down her throat and all that sort of stuff, I think that she would have had a very good chance of being diagnosed with it based on you know stuff I read at the time and so on. But I also, as soon as I read up on it, I'm like, I don't want her given a general anesthetic and I don't like what benefit is it going to be? The treatment for that condition is steroid slurries that the kids drink and it coats the throat to reduce that and flicks are tired and all sorts of stuff. And I'm like, that affects so many other things. And when I asked the question of what can we do to help their bodies, there's nothing you can do. It just didn't make sense. So that's where I trusted at the back of my mind, even though I was asking lots of questions, that there was something more to it. And I just didn't know what that was yet. And then a friend told me about this f pies thing and put me onto a di dietitian who did lactating con 
lactation consulting as well. So I could have the mixture of, and all these little nudges helped me because it just felt so right. And I just went with it, even though it wasn't impulsive, just went with it. It was like a full bodied, this is the direction I need to go in. And that's where I did start to trust. I just want to pause you again there, because that's another really excellent point, especially for listeners too. Mm. For you, Kristan, I'm putting you on the spot here. In your body, what is the difference between the whole body, yes, let's follow this, and the impulse? Oh, that looks okay. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever, like, tuned in? I think the, oh, yeah, that's okay, is the suggestive, and that sounds terrible, when someone's saying, yeah, let's go along to do this because it's the right thing to do. Like, there's the intent behind it versus me taking on hearing someone say something or making a suggestion, me sitting with it for a minute and basically asking my body, does this seem right? Or having it pass that litmus test, so to speak, of is this resonating with me? And then trusting that rather than someone says, so I automatically do. Yes. A little bit more of pause, I suppose. I love that. I think for everybody it's different. So for me, the impulse or somebody says, like I feel it in my head and my shoulders, like let's go, like dive in kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Whereas if it's my gut, like, you know, my gut feels enlivened or lit up and that's that full bodied yes. And I think for each of us, it's something worth looking at. And if you're not sure, then sit on it. Because often if it's that must do it now, get your free set of steak knives, whatever, there's an urgency in it, Yeah. then it's probably a no. And I think, you know, there's this difference between, not sounding too woo, but I like to call it following the divine breadcrumbs, like the providence of this person asking this and this person asking this and leading you down a path as opposed to, um, you know, just going like, because sometimes we do just listen to the expert and I'm not saying, neither of us are saying don't listen to experts, but if in your body you're getting a, I don't know, getting that second opinion or or doing, or or doing your own due diligence, um, for you because yeah nobody knows your body or that better than you do absolutely and sometimes it's as soon as someone's saying something you're going heck yes and you might hear it in your ears you might feel it in your chest in your belly in your whatever it might be that you see pictures that's some you know giving you some sort of yes and or no it doesn't have to be a yes. It can be a no, this is not okay, but you're not wanting to disappoint or something like that. And so your body is giving you some sign of, mm, I'm not really sure. And you're like, yeah, yeah, that sounds like a great idea because you don't want to displease that person. Yeah, as I say, that's people pleasing. And that's such a great point. When is it you're saying yes to people please? And when is it you're saying yes to your true calling? Because sometimes when we say yes to others, like we start a war within ourselves because like, I don't really want to do that, but I don't want to say no. And they know better than me. And yeah. So I could have said, okay, that gastroenterologist has done so many years of education and the conscious brain could have gone. My husband was like, well, he's just trying to give you the options. And I'm like, no, he's literally undermined my breastfeeding journey and said that I can't do it. Now, part of that was just the defiant me, but part of it was going, you really don't trust. He didn't trust in the breast milk that I was providing as being a solution for that situation. And I, it just was an all body no from a, I've got the, I've got the goods. I can deliver it to her and it's working for us. I know that this is right for me, not to undermine him in, in himself. And he's recognized as this big, whatever, and people tend to go to him as the epiphany of pediatric gastroenterology in Southeast Queensland. But it was just the attitude, the way it was delivered and the message that was delivered was just an all bodied, this isn't right for me. And so I never went back to him. I had considered at some point going back to say, oh, look, here's this perfectly beautiful, healthy that had no drugs and whatever. And then he would have just gone, well, see, I said that she didn't have it. And I've gone, it's not worth it. I didn't need I have the proof. You don't need that validation. And I just want to commend you for listening to yourself because a lot of times we don't. So, And the sad thing is so many people that I got to know along that journey, I've seen our parallel journeys and with what's come with their kids who are similar age to mine or, you know, before and after and that sort of thing. And it's a hard journey. No matter which journey you pick, it's not necessarily going to be rainbows and unicorns (laughs) but I'm so grateful 
that for me it's worked the way that it has and that we found the answers that we did and has her health been perfect no but it's been pretty spectacular in the scheme of it especially when I see what her siblings went through for the first six years seven years I suppose as we started to implement bits and pieces of what we came to find it has changed all of our lives that she was so sick I'm so grateful that would I change it no she was sick for a reason and that was part of our family's journey and it has now equated to thousands of people and possibly tens of thousands of people already having the opportunity to learn and understand what goes on in their body and to make that choice and again it's not going to be the choice that everybody wants to do necessarily but it's an option but I think too and I'll say this for the listeners it's turning around in my head when you come to work with Kristan, because I have for everyone listening, I'm that's not a secret. What I found different is if you go to a a Western, because we're talking East meets West in this uh in this episode, a, a, a more Western tradition, you take this this many times a day and you know go on about your merry way. Whereas when you work with Kristan, she makes suggestion. And then you try it and then you see how it feels and then you can add a bit more or drop a bit more and you you know, you know check in with your body and you encourage that every step of the way. And sometimes you'll be like, you know, this could happen or this could happen or it could be something else and we can adjust when you take the, the because I'm taking magnesium now, so it's like well, you could take it here and there. It's a very different approach. I think both of our work is like that, is in the person-centred rather than the solution i'm saying that if you're listening and not watching the video in you know the solution centered because i think that encourages the disconnect it's like take this this many times a day oh it makes me feel like this oh we'll just keep going like you'll get past it as opposed to oh well maybe we need to adjust the dose or the timing or the type slightly like with potassium and it's another thing we can do an episode this is more like a magnesium episode for potassium yeah, yeah. there's different types and before i've said to christian like this one's fizzing <laughs> so it's kind of like it's it, it is a journey and then checking in with your body and how your body responds yeah and those early days for me it it seems so long ago and yet just yesterday, but that was the beginning of me starting to trust. Again, it was like it was leaning back to her birth where I trusted my body, knew what it needed to do and that I had safety and medical intervention right there if I needed it. And as it happened, I did not. And all the things, it was like I was okay. I was giving myself permission to find what was best for us. And again, like on the formula side of things, some women who have really stressful stuff going on, like what I did, they need permission from someone else to go, actually, you know what? I can't go on anymore. I can't make enough milk to sustain my baby. And someone saying his formula, it's okay, is what they need. And that's okay. There's no judgment on anyone here who has formula fed babies or anything else. I formula fed but- both my babies. If anyone listening, I have um, formula was life-saving for my children. So it's finding the answers that are right for you, whether it's parenting, whether it's your own health or well-being, or decisions in your own life of you can see patterns that are happening that happen again and again and you're like, how do I break this cycle, which is so much of what we have started to talk about and obviously will in future episodes. It's this journey for me was, yes, okay, it was her health and growth and whatever. And when we found what was right for us, she started to sleep through the night within three weeks of adding magnesium to my body, not to her at all. She was too Mm. little. I didn't want to mess things up. I put four sprays of mag on my feet at night for the first week. And then the second week it was six sprays and there's like three on each foot type thing. And then the third week was eight. And in that week she started to sleep through the night. And I'm like, what's this witchcraft? Hang on a minute. And she stopped reacting to little things because I was on a pretty strict elimination diet at that stage, but there were still bits and pieces that she might react to. And it just changed. I'm like, how can that little amount of magnesium make a difference? And then I kept going up. And then I thought, oh, we're good. About four, no, it was nearly five months later. (laughs) I'm like, yep, I was traveling. I had Mag with me and I'm like, no, we've been doing really good. And then she turned into a screaming banshee again. And I'm like, what? How did that happen? Ah, She's attached to me 24-7 and all the things. It came right back to where we'd been. 
And I was really strict with my diet while I was traveling. I couldn't understand it. Anyway, got home, still screamy baby. And I thought, okay, well, I, I blamed it on the routine being different and different location and whatever. Wasn't that? Okay. And then I looked at the magnesium bottle and I'm like, surely not. Within 36 hours of starting mag on my body again, she was back to where she'd been. And I couldn't believe it. I clearly still needed that. And that gave me the confirmation that it wasn't just a placebo effect, that it wasn't just, you know, I've got enough mag now of five or whatever months worth of applying it to my skin. And it just continued from there. I kept being curious and asking the questions. And that's how I ended up finding out more about the mineral testing and all the rest of it that's now history. But when I got the mineral testing done for me, I was encouraged to go for me first, not her, even though she was my main focus because Hello, mums who don't put the oxygen mask on themselves first. I don't know any of those. Don't know what you're talking about. It's not almost <laughs> every single one. No. Uh, you know, I think it's part of, again, conditioning that we're putting, oh, don't be selfish. You've got to put the children first or whatever. And the innate mother instinct is to always take care of everyone else first. And it's not going to serve well, right? No, and it's not great people- modelling either because no. I-, I recorded a podcast as a guest recently on um the art of the art of being a mum and we talked about this and I said when I was growing up I love my mother dearly but I was like wow I I don't want to be a mum because once you become a mum you don't have friends or hobbies or whatever like you're I I, I hesitate to say it but you know just a mum and then I remember going to a friend's house and her her mum was in plays like she was an actor and you know she did all these things and I was like wow you, you can do that like once again the binary thing and yep. it was like, oh, but how do we do that? We model it. We don't martyr. Like I say to my children, you know, M is for mother, not for martyr or maid. <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. So I started to, get, I got the testing done, had a conversation with my now colleague and mentor, Molly Robbins. And I, like all the bars on the mineral chart were way below ideal. And I'm like, oh, well, that explains a lot. It's not just the mag- this magnesium thingy. It's this is my lifetime of not having enough nutrients. And then as we talked, I realized, because Molly said to me, tell me about your mum <laughs> and then your grandmother. And I went, okay, so we're up to three generations. And it wasn't completely lost on me because I'd been looking at that chart, as I mentioned, with all the magnesium related things and mum and my nan had those things. But what I didn't think of is if my nan grew up during World War I on rations and in rural places and she was better off than many, but still, what did she, the eggs that she developed, which turned into my mum, which and then pregnancy that she had with my mum and the eggs that became me well the egg that all gets affected so the nutrition of our mum and our grandmother has a huge impact so my girls my grandbabies their eggs are already present in my girls if they have babies and my nutrition when I was pregnant with them could well impact on that, but they've also had now many years and before they have kids, a whole lot more years, hopefully, of nourishing their body to be able to give that embryo and that baby the extra nutrients. But mine up the female line didn't have it. And I suddenly went, oh. Yeah, and I, I just want to say to that point too for anybody, I know in the past when things like that have happened to me, it reminds me of that quote, like when's the best time to plant a tree, like seven years ago or whatever, and the best times now. Sometimes yeah. we can be like, oh, what's the point? Like, yeah. you know, there is always a point. And like, yes, we can understand and go, okay, I'm not responsible. Like this is this is not my fault, but my yeah. responsibility going forward is to take care of me the best I can from now. And every time makes a difference. It looks like we're just having a visit <laughs> from a child. We're on a podcast. <laughs> yep. yes. It's all good. Child. I'm just looking at time. I have to wrap it up soon. So we've been gone yeah. for ages. Time flies. So, yeah, it, and I encourage anyone who's feeling really activated by that to acknowledge that you can't change what happened two generations ago. You can't change your kids that are already here or if you're pregnant or if you're considering having babies or anything like that, but you can change what actions you take moving forward. And that's been a huge learning thing for me is processing 
the choices that I make now are the choices that I want to be making. And for so much of my adult life, they were actually conditioned responses to a large degree that weren't necessarily my true preferred choice. I was, who was I speaking for? You know, it was the conditioning of childhood or different lived experiences. And I just encourage everybody that there's so much that we can do. We can be our own guru. We don't need to put that power with somebody else. And that's what this journey of mine, and I'm sure many people listening here, even if you're still in the early stages of that, if that natural intuition, that gut feel, that whatever you want to call it is saying, oh, fuck, I'm here. Mm. What can you do to foster that and not ignore it? Because so much of where we end up is someone else speaking, not us. Yes. And I love that choice versus conditioning and who's benefiting from this. Like, I don't want to go down conspiracy and big pharma and all that sort of stuff. But with with every choice that we've been conditioned to make, it's in someone's best interest and it's not always ours. Yeah. And we don't necessarily have to villainize or make somebody bad because often it is, you know, our parents taught us the best they knew at the time and then we've moved that forward. But then when we know better, we can do better or we can choose differently. And that, you know, that's forever evolving. Like what we say on this this version of this podcast right now, we might revisit a year or two or three years from now and go, actually, we have a totally different opinion now, but from where we stand, this is their opinion, you know, today. Yeah, for sure. And it, you have more in you than what you believe you do right now, potentially. And it's the journey that we're on is to reach that potential. I said, well, this is my view on the world. You can have your own view and that's okay too, but I really strongly encourage so much of when I'm working one-to-one and just observing, it doesn't even have to be in a client situation. The changes that we can choose, little baby steps that have just like that pharmacist happening to say that at the time, the little baby steps that we can choose to do in We are in control of that. I chose to change my food and that calmed the inflammation down. But I also chose to not live in that scared space of what if the food, and this was a huge hurdle to get over. Anyone who's had food intolerances or food reactions, the fear of eating that thing or how can I ever start that again? No, I'm just not going to touch it again because it'll make me sick. Finding how you can process that, like, help your body to be able to do it again. And it may not be a food. It might be to do something or a fear of spiders. Heck, I don't know. But, you know, something that seems that big, hairy, I can't go near that because it's too scary. Finding support to get your way past that. For me, it was EFT and meditations and that sort of thing, or EFT or tapping it's sometimes called. That helped me so much to realise, but also just doing baby steps. I would add a little bit more magnesium at a time. I loved that. The way you spoke about the couple of sprays and a couple more and a couple more and, you know, slowly introducing something, letting your body adapt to it, seeing how it responds. We can do that in whatever habit we want to create. And when we are, you know, in the binary all or nothing kind of, you know, false binary, I should say, we will look at those things and go, what's that going to do? A couple of sprays of magnesium more, you know, but the thing is it's everything, the tiny little things that you do and allow them to become your new normal. And then when you notice, Oh, I'm responding like this, like what's missing. Oh, it was the spray. Like that's the confirmation. I mean, whatever it is that you're trialing your own confirmations. Um, yeah, it makes, it's not, it's not something small. It's everything. Yeah. And you can do a little change and you can maintain a little change. And the adage of, a little is good, so lots is better. Please don't. Like you can really, to your to your comment, if you need it, uh, sorry, if you're very depleted and I, heck, I was there and I'm still a work in progress, but I'm better in my 40s than I was in my 30s or my 20s. And even after having or before kids when... <laughs> Those little parasites suck so many nutrients out of our bodies. (laughs) I do love my kids. It's just a figurative thing. Please don't worry. I don't treat my kids like parasites. At least not most of the time. (laughs) I love real talk. I'm here for it all the way. (laughs) Um, But if we're really depleted, the last thing you need to do is go and don't, please don't rush to the supermarket or the chemist and take heaps and heaps of, of magnesium or anything. That's not what you need. You yeah, it's like it's like exercise. If you were 
going back in and you're wanting to run a marathon, the trick isn't to go and force your body to run a marathon tomorrow. That's probably going to require an ambulance. Mm. It's to like start really, really small and allow everything to adjust and see how you respond. Yep. And those those hurdles become little speed bumps, not gigantic hospitalizations. <laughs> yes. Yes. Awesome. Was there anything else? Because I, I don't know. I didn't look at when we hit record, but we've been going for a while, but this has been such rich territory. So thank you so much for sharing your story and, and your daughter's story. And just, you know, people may not have the that in some in the exact same path of, you know, magnesium or something, but there's many things that we get that inkling or that hit or that thing, oh, I want to go this way, but we ignore it and listen to someone else. And as I said, we're not saying don't get external advice or don't follow but if you're having something that's not quite right get a second opinion or continue to you know lean into that because sometimes you know or often our own intuition is very powerful yeah yeah absolutely now if anyone would like to if you've loved this and you've listened to it and gone i really resonate with that we would love a review if you could please do that of this episode please listen to the other ones too and um, reviews really help with how this podcast, you know, goes through the interwebs and does its magic behind the scenes. Yeah, so- we could be, this episode could be the equivalent of the pharmacist for you to someone. Someone could listen exactly. to this and go, oh my gosh, I should, or could, I don't like the word should. And, you know, sometimes someone's offhand comment. And if we were that for one person, that would feel very, very rewarding. The other thing I want to um, add just before we finish up, Kristan, if the work that you do and you offer and the testing and stuff, if people want to talk to you about getting that ball rolling, how do they do that? Yep. They can find me on the web, supportingbalance.com.au or Facebook or Instagram, look up Supporting Balance and you'll find myself and my team. You can um, check out, there's a, a book with us type thing. So I can be booked in advance, but if not uh, myself, then I have some beautiful team members who can also guide you through the process. And there's heaps of resources so that you can understand what that is. You don't have to just blindly, again, I'm saying here, right? You don't have to blindly do anything that I say. You can go read up on it first. And if it resonates with you, then book in for it. But there's also 15 minute calls that you can book in with just to have a chat and to see if it's right for you as well. I totally recommend a 15 minute call with Kristan or any of the team. The team's probably sooner because Kristan's pretty booked out and the team is amazing support from supporting balance. You've so aptly named your business and um, yeah, it's, it's sensational. So I'd really encourage if this has resonated for you to check that out. That's awesome. Thanks. Suze. You're welcome. All righty. Well, we'll, Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we'll catch you on the next one. Bye for now. Bye.